Again, 2 Kings chapter 20, starting at verse 12, reads as follows. Shortly after this, Merodach Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, having heard that the king was sick, sent a get well card and a gift to Hezekiah. Hezekiah was pleased and showed the messengers around the place, silver, gold, spices, aromatic oils, his stockpile of weapons, a guided tour of all his prized possessions. There wasn't a thing in his palace or kingdom that Hezekiah didn't show them. And then Isaiah, the prophet, showed up. Turn to your neighbor and say, and the prophet showed up. <laughs> oh, that means you need to pay attention. <laughs> and just what were these men doing here? That's what Isaiah asked King Hezekiah. Where did they come from and why? Hezekiah said, they came from far away from Babylon. And what did they see in your palace? Everything, said Hezekiah. Turn to your neighbor, other neighbors. Say, don't show them everything. <laughs> Keep a few things secret. There isn't anything I didn't show them. I gave them the grand tour. Then Isaiah spoke to Hezekiah. Listen to what God has to say about this. The day is coming when everything you own and everything your ancestors have passed down to you right down to the last cup and saucer will be cleaned out of here, plundered and packed off to Babylon. God's word. Worse yet, your sons, the progeny of sons, your begotten, will end up as eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, if God says it, it must be good. But he was thinking to himself, it won't happen during my lifetime. I'll enjoy peace and security as long as I live. As you think about that, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. I'm going to read, starting at verse 24. Sometime later, Hezekiah became deathly sick. He prayed to God and was given a reassuring sign. But the sign, instead of making Hezekiah grateful, made him arrogant. This made God angry, and his anger spilled over on Judah and Jerusalem. But then Hezekiah and Jerusalem with him repented of his arrogance, and God withdrew his anger while Hezekiah lived. Hezekiah ended up very wealthy and much honored. He built treasuries for all his silver, gold, precious stones, spices, shields, and valuables, barns for the grain, new wine and olive oil, stalls for his various breeds of cattle, and pens for his flocks. He founded royal cities for himself and built up huge stocks of sheep and cattle. God saw to it that he was extravagantly rich. Hezekiah was also responsible for diverting the upper outlet of Gihon Spring and rerouting the water to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah succeeded in everything he did. But when the rulers of Babylon sent emissaries to find out about the sign from God that had taken place earlier, God left him on his own to see what he would do. Turn to your neighbor one last time and ask him, what you going to do if God leave you alone? God left him on his own to see what he would do. He, that's God, wanted to test his heart. I want to go back to 2 Kings chapter 20. I want to go to verse 16. Then Isaiah spoke to Hezekiah, listen to what God has to say about this. The day is coming when everything you own and everything your ancestors have passed down to you, right down to the last cup and saucer, will be cleaned out of here, plundered and packed off to Babylon. God's word, worse yet, your sons, the progeny of sons you've begotten, will end up as eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, if God says it, it must be good. But he was thinking to himself, it won't happen during my lifetime. I'll enjoy peace and security as long as I live. For the time that is ours together today, I'd like to preach to you from this simple subject or topic, 
meet the parents. Meet the parents. Meet the parents. Let us pray. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let all of those who call on the name of the Lord as Savior say on one accord, amen. Amen. You may take your seat. Meet the parents. In the year 2002, um, the hip hop rap artist by the name of Jay-Z on his second installment of the Blueprint series released The Gift and the Curse. It was a two disc set. Much like many of Jay-Z's songs, these songs tend to glorify a lot of things in life and violence and, and promiscuity and, and, and living fast life in the fast lane. It didn't have a lot of substance. But one of the songs on the second disc that was um, overlooked by many people, which actually had a lot of substance, was a song by the name of Meet the Parents. The title, which was inspired by the movie that came out two years before called Meet the Parents. It was in this song that Jay-Z talks about a young man who dies. In fact, he tells the story in reverse. I must admit it was quite creative. It gives some tips even for a preacher. That he, he, he starts from the end and then works his way back to the beginning to figure out how did we get here. He talks about this um, young girl who falls in love with this young man because she wants to be in the fast life. They have a child together, but because the child doesn't look like him, he doesn't claim the child and puts all the responsibility on the mother. Um, he sees his child two times, and then for the next 14 years, he lives his life and has fun running the streets. And then when the song gets to the second scene, we find this father, his name is Mark, he's now 32 years old. His son is 15 years old. The father still runs the streets, he still packs, he's 38. Um, and, and, and as Jay-Z says in the background, it's ironic that, that many of us, many of us young people in the hood, young men won't even live to 38. He runs into this young man that's about 15 years old. He's also packing a newer version of a 38. The young man, he tries to tell him to get off the block. He says, you can't stand here. And the young man looks at him and, and gives an expletive that I cannot repeat in the pulpit or even repeat it, period. And then the young man um, pulls out his 38, draws it on the man that's 32 years old. And as the young man looks into his eyes, he seems like he sees himself. He, he seems like he sees an older version of himself and then he's stunned. He pauses. And then as Jay-Z says that when you pause, then you can lose. And then the older man, because he goes off of his instinct, his natural proclivities, he fires six shots into this young man's chest. And as he fires the shots, he realizes that it is his son that he's not seen for 15 years. And then Jay-Z goes into this little soliloquy and he, he, he says that, he, he goes to the soliloquy and he says the old man just followed his instinct. Six shots into his kin out of the gun. Brothers, that's my edit, be a father, you're killing your son. Six shots into his kin out of the gun. Brothers, be a father, you're killing your sons. Making the point of the clarion call that even Jay-Z is trying to make that we need to be better parents. He says even in this song that, that the sister tried her best, but she can't raise a man all by herself. I, I know in the times in which we live, I know as statistics say that many of the families of color that our families have 80% single parent households. And, and, and as Jay-Z, when he says his particular statement, it's, it surprises many people because they wouldn't think he would have this perspective that it does 
take two parents to raise a child, that when you have two parents, it does make a difference in a household. And, and, and before you get too mad at me and shut me out, I want you to just keep listening in because it's, it's a point here that God has tried to make and provide for humanity. And when God has created us and made man and woman in his own image, and when God made man and woman, he put them together. He, he gave Adam a suitable help made it, and he gave her to him. And he said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And then he left and he cleaved to her, and then they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply. But for many of us, when we look at the reality in which we face today, and, and for some of us in our experience, that that has not been the reality, that the reality of what God has intended for families isn't what we find to be the case. I know when we look out into society and culture, we find a culture shift and a culture change in the way that we even define family. Even the pastor, I get interviewed just to find out when people want to join the church and visit the church. They want to know what kind of things do you believe in? What, what is you all's theology? What's your perspective when it comes to family? I won't say the name, but one of you even interviewed me after I was called the pastor to want to find out what was my view on family? What did I, did I see value in, in, in the nuclear family? And, and what was my perspective when it comes to mothers and fathers as well as single mothers? We find here in our particular passage today, we, we find this king who is not much different his time in which he lived, even though it's many, many thousands of years ago he's faced with some of the same type of challenges that we face today. That, that families back then had difficulties, had challenges in the culture in which they live, and it was sometimes, many times, difficult for the people of God to be faithful. That by the time we arrive in chapter 20, we learn, about, we, we hear about this king. His name is Hezekiah. He's one of the great kings of all the kings in southern Judah. He, he's one of the kings that gets said after his name that he, in fact, in, king, in 2 Kings chapter 18, that he was a king who held fastly to the Lord and followed the God, the Lord God so faithfully that he was compared to David. You must understand in the Bible, for a father, a, a, the, to a king to be compared to David means that he did a pretty good job. That didn't mean that he was perfect because we know that David was not perfect. And Lord knows David was not the best parent. We already know that. David had some issues, but it was something about David because he was a man after God's own heart, that he was faithful to God because he loved the Lord God, that every great king that came after him was compared to David. In fact, we find even in Luke as well as Matthew, as, as the angel comes and talks to Mary, and she, she's told that God is going to give the throne of David to his son, the son that you are carrying, who is named Jesus Christ. That when we look across scripture, the model for faithfulness of a man, the model even for faithfulness even of a father is typically compared to David. Even when you talk to those of our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith. Don't talk bad about David because David is lifted up high because he was faithful. So we find this King Hezekiah. We arrive in chapter 20 of 2 Kings that he's now in the second leg of his life, that, that he is on coming down the downstroke of his life, that God has blessed him, God has fought some battles for him, God has given him a measure of success. In fact, God has allowed him to partially unify the kingdom that the people were worshiping all over the place. They were doing all kinds of things and, 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 and Hezekiah is one of the kings who we come across who calls the people back to God. This is even before we get we even talk about um, even, this is even before we talk about the king, uh, the prophets like Elijah. That We got this particular king called Hezekiah that he reforms the congregation, the church and the temple, the people of God. He calls them to be faithful in a time when it's not popular, when folks want to follow their own kind of ways, they want to do their own kind of things, but Hezekiah is faithful to the Lord. And so God blesses him. He gets sick, we find, in the beginning of chapter 20, and, and God gives him 
15 years more of life. What would you do if God gave you 15 more years of life? That God told you the clock is ticking, you got 15 more years, what would you do with your time? What, what, I mean, what, what would you do with all that time knowing that the clock now ticks, you got 15 more years? Well, God gave him 15 more years. And God even prospered him. God gave him wealth. God gave him power. God gave him prestige. God gave him a name. God made his reputation revered, made him popular all around the land. In fact, folks come around to see him. We see some people from a place called Babylon. And for most of you who know your Bible, whenever you hear about Babylon, not good stuff happens. That when you hear Babylon, what's going to happen or what's going to follow is not so good. But we find Hezekiah, one of the fathers of the faith, the, one of the great kings of the faith. God gives him 15 more years, and in those 15 more years, God blesses him with a son by the name of a Manasseh. You can read it when you come home. Manasseh is born Three year, two years later, three years later, after King Hezekiah, he's told he has 15 years left to live. And that's where I want to focus our attention today. I want to focus our attention a little bit on what we do with our time as parents. With the time that we know God gives us, this limited time that God gives us as people of faith to raise our Children, And I want to use as my little hermeneutic, I like to say, of my application, this principle of meeting the parents. I want us to meet Hezekiah, the father, the parent in this scripture today. And I think God will give us some words of encouragement, some words of challenge to help us in our parenting. And just if you're thinking, well, I don't have no kids, so this sermon is not for me. No, no, this sermon is for folks who are either spiritual parents or biological parents. And if and you might be a, a community parent in your community, some children that you know need some, some parental figures, some positive figures in their life who can love them, can care for them, this message is also for you. So that covers almost everybody. And for my young people, it'll help prepare you when you get to where we get to prayerfully one day. Because we find here in our passage today that Hezekiah is bragging on himself. He's, he's boasting on himself. And as we learned in chapter 32 in the book of Second Chronicles that God left him by himself. And that's where we're right now in the passage. God has left him by himself and God is looking down from heaven and he's wondering, is he going to brag on me? Is he going to boast on me for what I have done for him? In other words, this is right after he's been healed. He has been given 15 more years of life and God is looking to see what is he going to do with it. We find Hezekiah, he, he boasts and brags on him Self. He talks about himself and he's kind of gotten off track a little bit. And like we sometimes do after God has blessed us, we start to brag on ourselves instead of bragging on the one who made it all possible. We find that if we're going to brag and boast on anything, we got to be like the Apostle Paul and say, I'm going to brag on the Lord because it's the Lord who made this thing possible. It's the Lord God who made a way for me. It's the, it's the Lord God who helps me to do what I'm able to do. In fact, he said it this way in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2 that we can only, that what God has done has been so marvelous that nobody can brag on it. It's been done all by God. And if we're going to be faithful parents and we're going to be faithful spiritual parents and we're going to be progenitors of the faith to carry it in the parents pass it on to the next generation and we're going to have to learn how to properly brag and boast on the Lord right here in our passage we find that Hezekiah he teaches a few things or two that we can learn that can help us we find that he that, that if we're going to be that if we're going to be able to boast properly in the Lord if we're going to set an example to the next generation then we're going to have to learn to be faithful we're going to have to learn to believe and trust the Lord 
Where you get that from, preacher? I didn't see that in the passage where you got to read all of the Bible. Because we find that Hezekiah, in the opening of chapter 20, when Hezekiah is on the point of death, when he's about to be gone, the prophet Isaiah, the man of God, comes and give him a word and says, Thus saith the Lord, get your house in order. You about to be out of here. And the first thing we see that Hezekiah does is he gets on his knees and he prays and he proceeds to remind the Lord how faithful he has been. When the last time when you prayed on you, you got on your knees and prayed to the Lord, you could tell him how faithful you've been. Lord God, remember me. Give me some more time. I have been faithful to you. I have put my trust in you. I have believed in you. I have, I have done the things that you have called me to do. Hezekiah is faithful. Not perfect. He's faithful. And what the generations, the new generation, the young people need to see is more faithful Christians more faithful followers of Christ. The narrative of Hezekiah is he reforms the temple. He cleans up the temple. He's faithful to God. He puts his hope and trust in God. His, his father put his hope and trust in allies and people who had nothing to do with God. But Hezekiah is faithful and putting his hope and trust in God. Put your hope and trust. And God, like the psalm says, some trust in chariots and horses, but we'll trust in the name of the Lord. That if we want to brag and boast on anything, we want to boast on the Lord, we can brag and boast by being faithful. He's faithful. He tells the Lord, God, remember me how I walked before you in faithfulness. <laughs> that I've been coming to you and I've been putting my trust in you. I've been faithful. But not only is he faithful, we learn that he's also committed. <laughs> now, I know that many folks can't have this claim, and I'm going to preach it. I'm going to tell the truth because I know the devil is a lie. Many of us who call ourselves saints, we are not always faithful, and we're not always committed. He goes to prayer and says, Lord, God, remember me before you take me out of here. Look, Lord God, I have kept your commandments. I have held fast to you. He's kept his commandments. He said, look, I have been committed to you with my whole heart. David, the, the apostle Paul says it this way, friend with the world is enemy with God. What, what do the children of God got to do with fellowship with the people of the world? And I think in the times in which we live right now, the church has gotten too comfortable and too friendly with the world. <laughs> That's why when you turn on your TV, you, you, you look at the politics of the land. You, you look at folks who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and they align themselves with particular political figures who have nothing to do with the things of God. Some of them don't even recall a time when they had to ask the Lord for forgiveness. He says, look, I have been committed to you, Lord. We got to learn to be committed to the things of the Lord. We got to be committed to the commandments of the Lord. We got, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. You'll obey my commandments. We got to learn to be committed. That means you can't get all like you're going to run and quit and throw in the towel when somebody look at you kind of funny when you come to church or when they say something to you over social media. You got to learn to be committed to the cause of Christ. Hezekiah, when you look at his story, his narrative, as he reforms the temple worship and the people of God, he sends out a messengers, sends out messengers to all of the land, to Judah. That's the southern kingdom. I'll give you a little Bible today, some little, some little history. And then he sends out the people to the northern kingdom. At this point in time, the kingdom that David had unified has been split up since after Solomon has died. And when he sends them to the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom is apostate. They don't follow the Lord God. They are worldly. They, they're more committed to the things of the world. They got their own type of worship. He sends people to them say, come on back home. We need to worship here in Jerusalem. And when he sends the people out, they laugh at him. <laughs> you can look at it when you come home. They laugh at him. They ridicule them. They're like, what's up with you, man? We're not going to do that. We like the way things are right the way they are. We like doing things the way we do them in Bethel and Dan. But Hezekiah keeps on following the Lord. He's still committed to the Lord. Even if folks laugh at him, even if folks make fun of him, he is still committed to the Lord. 
It could be said like this way. If you look at Joshua chapter 24, Joshua says, look, our fathers worship all these kind of little gods out here. Our fathers did all this kind of crazy stuff. But, but you know, you know, you got to choose this day whom you going to serve. Will it be the God of your fathers? But as for me and my house, we going to serve the Lord. We are committed to the Lord. I don't care what the world have to say. I don't care what they talking about on the news. I'm going to serve the Lord. Hezekiah is committed. If we're going to be better parents, if we're going to be more faithful Christians, more faithful followers of God, we're going to have to be committed. Faithful. Be committed. He says, I've been committed, Lord. I've been in it for you. I, I, I've been ride or die for you, Lord. But I've also been holy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's right there. I know we're quiet on this too. I, I know it's, you're going to be quiet. Don't worry. I'm going to have a shout for you then. You, 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 you're quiet now because he, he, he was holy. <laughs> that, the, the, God says, I'm a holy God. Be holy as I'm holy. He, 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 he says, I've done the right thing. That's what holy is, by the way. Do the right thing, like Spike Lee said. He, he did the right thing. He didn't do what man said do. He didn't try to follow and, and get, and get um, friends by what the world standards were. He said, I have followed your commands. I've done what is good. Ooh. I've done what's right in God's eyes. <laughs> not what's right in the culture's eyes. I, I've not tried to blend in with the culture. I've tried to be light and salt in the culture. I've not tried to rear my children with practices of the world that would allow me to fit into the world, but I've raised them by God's standards. I've followed the Proverbs um, 26 where it says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they grow old, it will not depart from them. I've trained them up in the way they're supposed to go. He says, look, I have done the right thing. I have been holy. What do your neighbors say about your family? What would be your neighbor's report? Or as we said in Bible studies, we, what, would be their, what would be the letter they're reading about your household? Do they see a God-centered, God-fearing household? Or do they see a household no different than theirs? Do, do what, what's on the TV in your house? What comes up is the recommendation on Netflix and Prime for you. Would it be representative of something that would make God proud? As you're wondering why they're wilding out and acting so crazy and don't not act and so disrespectful, who's disrespectful, could it be because of the example that you have set or we have set because we've not been holy enough? <laughs> I remember <laughs> one day I was at home with the children. <laughs> My wife was out running an errand. They, they, they were getting teenage years. And, and, and you know, my, I'm, I'm, my wife is normally at home with the children. And, and, and I'm going to work, so I don't really know how some of the stuff work in the house. So I don't know all the passwords and codes on the TV. You're going to get this in a second. And so my kids try to pull a fast one on me and try to get me to go put the code in to go figure out something on the TV for them to watch. I don't really know anything about what's going on with it because I'm working all the time. And, but I don't know the code. I don't even know what I, the code to unlock the TV screen for them to watch whatever they want to watch on TV. And then I thought about it and said, I don't even want to know the code. And in fact, we asked my wife, she could remember the code. <laughs> so nobody could figure out how to get on the TV and watch that particular show or whatever they wanted to watch. God calls us to be holy. As God is holy. What are the desires of your heart? Are you following the Lord wholeheartedly? Hezekiah says, I've been faithful. Hezekiah says, Lord, I have been committed to you. Lord, I have been holy to you. And because he's done those three things at this point, in point God heals him and gives him 15 more years. God gives him 15 more years because he's been faithful, because he's been committed. He's been holy. God has given him some more time to get some things right, to get some things in order in his household to be a blessing to his household. That takes me to the next point I want to make here in our passage because God 
calls us, after we're faithful, after we, if we're committed to Christ, if we are holy as God is holy, we do good, then we ought to be prayerful. Hezekiah is a praying man. <laughs> uh, he, he's a praying man. I, I know what I'm, I'm doing my premarital counseling. I like to meet with the fellas. We have a little talk because I want to know if you're a praying man. Because <laughs> she's going to need a praying man. You're going to need to be a praying man for your marriage to work. Do I got any witnesses here can testify? You got to be a praying man. Now, I, and I know you got to be a praying woman, but we need some more praying men. Hezekiah prays when it's time to go to battle. Hezekiah prays when he's got to go make a decision to deal with an enemy. Hezekiah prays to the Lord when he needs to get more, when he needs his health to be restored. He's prayerful to God. He, he goes to the Lord God in prayer. And his prayer is not a little um, simple little, now I lay me down to sleep. If I die before I wait, I pray the Lord my soul to take. No, it says in this passage, it says up in the beginning of chapter 20, it says he prays bitterly. He weeps Bitterly, his tears are bitter tears. He cries seriously, and he's and as he reminds God of what he's done, he's praying substantively to God. That, that our prayer lives need to be much deeper. Our prayer lives need to be much richer. We need to be praying more on our knees for our children. We need to be on our knees much more than sitting up on the sofa watching TV all day long in, 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 in this coronavirus pandemic. We need to be on our knees praying. Well, like, I want the coronavirus to be over. Well, how much have you been praying for the coronavirus to be over? How much have you been on your knees praying for God to work a miracle and reminding God of your faithfulness and your commitment and your holiness to God? We need to do more praying, and our praying needs to be more substantive. We need to pray for our children. Our children are about to go back to school. We don't, they're going to be online. You need to be praying for them. Especially praying for some of our parents, praying for some of our single parents, trying to figure out what they're going to do with their work and their job. We need to be on our knees praying more because the prayers of the righteous avail of much. We need to become a praying church, a praying people. Before we make any kind of decision, we need to pray to the Lord. Before you decide to marry her or him, you need to pray to the Lord. Before you decide to leave that job or quit that job, you need to be praying. Oh, now, before you decide to put your hands on your child in, in anger, you need to be praying to the Lord for God to give you a spirit of self-control, which is the Holy Spirit. We need to be prayerful. He's committed, check. He's faithful, check. He's holy, check. And he prays. So what's wrong with Hezekiah, preacher? <laughs> you opened this up with an issue with Hezekiah. Hezekiah looks ideal. Hezekiah looked cool. Hezekiah looked like a candidate to be a pastor. He like a candidate to be a deacon. What's wrong with Hezekiah? Hezekiah is faithful. Hezekiah is committed to God. Hezekiah is holy. Hezekiah prays. But Hezekiah, after the Lord blesses him, is not humble. I was recently reading an article that was talking about if Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was alive today, he would be 91 years old. And as he looks across the landscape and looks at the situation with African Americans post-1968 Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, would he see things looks better? And in the article says he would probably see a people who have become complacent, have become arrogant, have gotten so big on themselves, done got their college degrees, done been able to move out to the suburbs, been able to get some PhDs, some MBAs, some MDs behind the name, some JDs. They're able to live in these suburbs, go on all types of vacations. They've gotten kind of arrogant. They've got, they've stopped putting God first. They have forgotten about the Lord. They act like they got there on their own. They act like they put themselves through college. They act like they allowed, gave themselves that credit score. He says they're not humble. We find in Hezekiah. 
after the Lord God blesses him. As we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, God says, well, I'm going to stop sending the prophet to tell you what to do. I'm going to stop sending the priest to tell you what to do. You don't spend enough time with the prophet and priest. You don't spend enough time in God's word. You didn't heard enough good biblical teaching. I'm just going to stand back and look and see what you're going to do. I'm going to look and see if you're going to make the right move for me. I'm going to look, can you give me glory and honor? Now that I have blessed you, now that the prophet is not around looking over your shoulder, will you give me glory and honor for what I've done? And look what Hezekiah does. Hezekiah shows off what he has. He shows off his riches. Never at any point does he say the Lord did this thing for me. It was the Lord, as it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, blessed him and gave him his wealth. It is the Lord who back in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 fought his battles for him and pushed back Assyria. He never mentions the fact that the Lord God did this for him. The Lord God had restored him to the health that he had. He shows off what he has and he acts like he's bad all by himself. He acts like he got there on his own. You didn't get there on your own. You, you, you didn't get to the position you in on your own. It's somebody's shoulders that you're standing on. You don't get a right, you don't get to go vote in November because you went and marched and did Freedom Summer. You standing on the shoulders of somebody else who walked by faith and not by sight, put their hope and trust in the Lord. One of the tragedies of black middle class, one of the tragedies of people of color when they got wealth, they forget about God. I want to get all brand new. I don't need God. I don't send my kids to soccer and football on Sunday. We don't need to go to church. Yes, I did say it. We put every Everything else before the Lord, but it's the Lord God who gave you stability in your life. It's the Lord God who kept you from losing your mind when you was raising those kids, when he walked out on you. It was the Lord God who kept you in perfect peace because your mind was saying, him, how dare you forget about the Lord God after the Lord God blessed you as he provided for you. He sustained you. He allowed you to make it through college, allowed you to pass that class when you know you messed up, when you was tore up from the floor up. He bless you with a good smile. How dare you turn your back on the Lord? Be humble. Hezekiah is not humble in the latter stages of his life. I believe if we're going to turn things around in our community, we're going to have to get back to being humble. We're going to have to get back to having some humility. We have to get back to being willing to serve instead of complaining all the time. Want to get our name mentioned. Want our name on the plaque. Getting all mad because somebody didn't remember our name. Getting so arrogant like we all that in a bag of chips instead of recognizing like, it's, like, like, like the psalmist said, it is better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I got any doorkeepers in the house? Any folks that I'm just glad that he saved me. I'm just glad that he watched me and make me wise. I'm so glad he just saved me. I don't even deserve to be here. I don't know how I got here. It's by the grace of God. We find you can be faithful. <laughs> you can be committed to God. You can be holy. You can be ride or die Christian and be arrogant. Could it be the world don't want to listen to the church because the church then got too big. The church then got too arrogant. Could it be when you turn on the DNC this week, you will get the RNC in, a, in, a, in like a week or two, that they got a pass and fancy for the church because we done got too big. We just glad to just be there so we can pop our name and say that we know the president or we know the senator. Could it be we've gotten too arrogant? Could it be that we don't pack the church with the young people? Could it be your children not saved because you done got too arrogant? <laughs> that you forgot to give glory to God. You forgot to teach them the precepts of God. You act like you got there all by yourself. Could it be they don't want nothing to do with God because you've gotten so big and bad on yourself? We find King Hezekiah, 15 years to go, clock is ticking. Got a 12-year-old son 
He's 12 years old at this point. You can read it when you get home in chapter um, 33, in chapter 21 of 2 Kings, in, in, in 2 Chronicles. I've done my homework. He's 12 years old when he becomes the king. His dad dies when he's 12 years old. He's born three years into his last 15 years. And, and, and here Hezekiah, when we read in the passage, nothing is said about what he's doing in his household. All four chapters are dedicated in 2 Chronicles to what he did for the church. Four, four chapters are dedicated to what he did for the people of Israel. Four chapters, of, we got chapters dedicated how he prayed to the Lord to heal his health. But when it comes to his family, we hear nothing about his family. He ups and dies. His son at 12 years old becomes the king and he turns his back on the Lord. He's like, I got mine. You go on and get yours. He, he, his son is not prepared to leave the kingdom because Hezekiah got so big he too busy doing grand tours showing off what he's got he's too big with his big TV having having Super Bowl parties with his buddies instead of training up his child and the way he's supposed to all go so when he grows old he won't depart from the Lord it ought not be after you go to work that when you come home it's extra or too much to spend time with your child. No, not being coronavirus. We need psychiatrists and shrinks because we can't spend the whole day in the house with our kids. It ought not be they need to get the kids back to school and they might get coronavirus because we don't know how to act and we up here abusing our children. Yes, I did say it. That's why they want to send them back to school, by the way. The psychologist said the parents don't know how to act. The parents not mentally stable. They not used to being around their kids for so long, so they want to ship them off to the world, and you wondering why they don't want to have nothing to do with Jesus. You got, you got eight hours a day that you could be teaching them about Jesus. You could be opening up God's word. You could be praying to God. When the last time you prayed to your kids? When the last time you opened up? They ought to know all of the Bible by now. It's been six months months and coronavirus have you cracked the word open to them have you helped them see the word it's a lamp to my feet a light to my path God your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee oh the Lord God is my strength my shield and my strength the Lord God is my light and my salvation how you get to where you got mommy and daddy it was by the grace of God it was God who loved me it is God who tells me in Psalm 139 I'm fearfully and wonderfully made it's the Lord God who made a way out of nowhere. It is the Lord God who loves me, who saves me. The Lord God who lifted me out of the muck and miry clay of life. When the last time you shared Jesus with your children? Don't even, you ain't even got to raise your hand. I already know the answer because I'm talking to the children. They don't know enough word and we've been at home for six months. Hezekiah, when he's told, you're going to die. It says, actually, thus saith the Lord. Now, you got to understand your Bible. The prophet, the man of God, shows up and says, thus saith the Lord, you're going to die. Get your house in order. And Hezekiah prays. He reminds the Lord he's been faithful. He reminds the Lord he's been committed. He reminds the Lord he's been holy. Thus saith the Lord is almost irrevocable. <laughs> but he gets on his knees and prays to the Lord and weeps bitterly. But now, at the end of his life, <laughs> when he's told, look, hear the word of God. Now, hear the word in the Old Testament means perceive. That's in verse 18 and 19, 16 through 19, just so you know, but for those who are not following. And he says, per hear, perceive the word of God. Here perceive is easier to move God and to move God to compassion and grace than thus saith the Lord. For some reason, earlier in his life, he a prayer warrior. Early in his life when he's coming up the mountain, when he needs God to fight some battles for him, when he don't have a lot, when he's not popular and everybody coming to see him, he prays and he prays for something that seems impossible for God to do. But by the time he's in the later part of his life, he's so arrogant, he's not humble, that now he's become 
inconsistent. That's my last point. Put it up on the board. I know it says consistent. Be consistent, but he's inconsistent now. He's supposed to be praying right now. God said, God told you you're going to die. You prayed to him, and God gave you 15 more years. Now when it comes to your children, God say, look, they're going to they're going to become eunuchs. They're going to use their they're going to lose their ability to be fruitful and be able to multiply in the land where they are. That's what it means to be a eunuch. They would not be able to procreate. They would not be able to, to produce offspring. It's going to be really bad for the next generation. He said, "In fact, it's going to be really bad for the next generation and the next generation." And look what Hezekiah does. Hezekiah sits there and says, "Well, God is good." And don't we like to say that when we come to church? We like to say, "God is good what all the time no that's not what the bible says it says god is good his mercy and truth endures forever god is consistent forever and so he says and says well god is good since god is good at least i'll have peace and security in my lifetime oh what does that mean now i'm gonna god is good and then he thinks to himself i will have peace and security that means I will not have to rock the boat in my lifetime. Since God said it, I'll just let it happen and I'll have my peace. Now I must admit, after we pushed our first teenager into adulthood, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what happened with me, but it took so much energy to get the first teenager into adulthood. God gave us a six year break for the next set of teenagers <laughs> and by the time we got to the next set of teenagers I found myself getting a little bit more tired when it came to confronting issues and with the mouth and with the kind of attitude when they walk in the door with some of the nonsense they was learning in school I found myself getting tired and I just wanted to have peace I found myself after working a whole day I used to come home and my wife would tell me what's been going on in the house and I have to sit down with the kids and tune them up for what's been going wrong in the house that shouldn't have went down but I found myself in the second half of raising the kids want to come home and go to the bedroom and close the door and turn on my TV I didn't want to really confront no issues and they want to rock the boat I just wanted to have some peace and security I don't want nobody to get mad but then my Bible says Jesus said he said in Matthew chapter 10 I didn't come to give peace I did not I've come to bring a sword that father will be against son that son will be against father, daughter will be against mother, mother against daughter, daughter, mother-in-law against um, daughter-in-law. Because he said, if because he, he says that if you will lose your life for me, then you will gain your life. But if you try to save your life, then you will lose your life. What you're talking about, preacher? He's saying, look, if you're going to share the things of Jesus, if you want to leave a lasting legacy for your family, it's going to get rough sometimes. You can't always have peace in the household with the kids are going off in the wrong direction if the kids in your community don't know they left from their right you can't act like it's copacetic and just say hey what up when they walking down the street and hope that they don't say nothing to you you gotta and confront them you gotta confront the issues in our land and make a difference in their life you can't act like when they come to church and they don't know how to conduct themselves properly in worship that you're not gonna say nothing so you can just have peace so you can just worship the Lord. You got to be able to engage them in a healthy way. Carefully discipline them. They can understand the things of the Lord. That you can't have peace if you don't give glory to God. You can't have peace in your house when your kids are losing their mind. You can't have peace when you know they're going to fail out of high school if you don't do something about it. You can't have peace if you know that they're not going to be able to get a job and be able to take care of them. You can't have peace if they 30 and 40 years old still stand in your house and don't know how to manage a budget and don't know how to take care of a family. You can't have peace if you taking care of your grandkids and your great grandkids and your great great grandkids because they're repeating the same mistakes that you repeated because you never took the time to train them up in the way they should go so when they grow old it won't depart Hezekiah is faithful <laughs> deacon pastor come to church 
every Sunday. Nominated to be on everybody committee at the church every time you call him. Won't take the family on vacation because he loved the church so much. Faithful, committed to the Lord, can quote the Bible backwards and forwards. Holy, dress nice, don't cuss, but then got arrogant. Think cause he arrived, it's all about him. Leaves nothing for the next generation. Has become inconsistent. Now he don't pray no more. <laughs> Every other time he had a problem, he prayed. You look the scripture. I, I've been looking at them all week long. I've memorized all. Second Chronicles, Second Kings. He prayed every time there's a problem, except when it came to his kids in the next generation, hiding out at the church instead of leading his family. Well, like Jay Z said. Meet the parents. Don't even know who your kids are. Meet them when you got to get them out of jail for the first time. Or meet them when they get shot up and die. Two, three generations locked up, incarceration, still not moved to make a difference in that generation. The Brookings Institution did a study back in 2016. They said that, um, 2015, they said that um, the African-American people of color are in deep trouble because we've obtained the middle class status. We've elected the first African-American president. We, we're we're post-civil rights. But as they look at the landscape, they find that the next generation goes backwards and falls in poverty. In fact, 60% of middle class African-American children fall into poverty. That they do not repeat what their parents did, they actually go backwards. Could it be because we're so happy riding around in our fancy car, got our four, five bedrooms where everybody got their own bedroom, so nobody sitting at the dinner table, nobody talking, nobody communicating with nobody, nobody do any family time together, that they don't understand how you got there, you've not passed down the faith, you've not told them about Jesus Christ, you've not showed them how God's word has been working, it's been living and active, it's been a two-edged sword, pierce you to the mar bone marrow, how God has been working in your life, so now when they get up and grow old, they don't know how to achieve, they don't know how to persevere, they don't know how to be able, despite obstacles, keep pressing forward the mark of the call of, of Christ, which we've been called. The next generation ain't strong. They don't have resilience. They, they, they need safe places in school because they can't deal with being confronted or people confront them. I'm keeping it real for, the, for my older parents who ain't been to the school lately. They need a safe place in school. When they go to college, they need safe places because we've not helped them be resilient enough to handle obstacles in life. Dropping out in high numbers out of college. Falling into poverty. Mama happy cause son stayed at home and he 30, 40 years old and acting like that's okay and normal. Meet the parents. <laughs> you can be faithful. You can be committed. You can be holy. You can be prayerful starting out. But you let your head get too big you become arrogant, don't pass the faith on, and become inconsistent. As I'm prepared to close, <laughs> I'm reminded, I got this few illustrations of family today because this hit me home. This almost knocked my teeth out this week, this sermon. I'm sitting there reflecting back on raising our kids. I remember one time, <laughs> our oldest <laughs> wanted to move back in the house. We sat down, he wanted to negotiate the terms for moving back in the house. <laughs> and so we said, okay, cool, let's come on and sit down and negotiate your terms for moving back in the house. 
he proceeded to tell us what he wanted to see happen in the house, what he wanted to do. <laughs> he wanted to do some things that, 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 we, that we don't do in our house. <laughs> in my house, your, your, your girlfriend don't get to come upstairs. I'm going right there today. <laughs> in my house, your girlfriend don't, your boy, your boyfriend don't get to go in the bedroom with you in the closed door. In my house, your girlfriend, boyfriend don't get to go on vacation with the family if they ain't put no ring or you ain't put no ring on their finger or, or they put a ring on your finger. <laughs> we want to negotiate the terms of being in the house. In my house, I don't care what age you are, the curfew is 12 o'clock a.m. on Friday, Saturday. And it's 10 o'clock p.m. Sunday through Thursday. <laughs> I don't care how old you get. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We sit there negotiating the terms of moving back in. <laughs> Dad, mama, y'all don't ever change. Y'all have not changed in 27 years. Y'all still doing the thing. And I sat there and looked at him, and I said, you got that right because I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm leaning on his, his unchanging hand. I, I, I'm following Jesus Christ because he's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. On Christ this solid rock I stand. Everything else is sinking sand that I, 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 I don't care what the world says. The world can go to hell in a handbag. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Son, I guess you're meeting your parents again because we're going to be ride or die Christian until we go on to be in glory with the Lord. Hezekiah was a good king. Hezekiah was a faithful king. Hezekiah was a Hezekiah was a committed king. Hezekiah was a holy king. Hezekiah was a praying king, but he wasn't the most perfect king. He wasn't the greatest king that ever came. Because I know another king who had come that's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I know another king that though Hezekiah died and he never came back, this king died and he came back. Hezekiah, the Lord had to leave him alone. So he didn't have the prophet because he wasn't the prophet. He was just the king. But I know a man by the name of Jesus. A man that's not only the king, but he's also the prophet. Because in my Bible, it says in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And the one who brings the word and is the word is a prophet. Jesus Christ is the prophet in the king but he's not just the prophet in the king he's also the priest who makes atonement for our sins hezekiah needed a priest and had to clean up the priest and get their act together to make atonement for the people's sins but god at the fitting time when god saw that rams and bushes would no longer do when god saw that he needed something to work for all perpetuity god said i'll fashion a body for myself, I'll send my son to be the lamb of God because my son is holy. My son is good. My son is the prophet. My son is the long awaited Messiah, the king. My son is faithful. Even when we're not faithful, he's faithful in just that. You can submit your petitions to the Lord. You can ask him for forgiveness. He's faithful and just to forgive you of all sins and cleanse you of all righteousness. But he's not just a faithful prophet, priest, and king. He's also a committed king. He's a committed Lord and Savior because my Bible says that it is he who began a good work in you will fulfill it on the day of the Lord. My Bible says that for the joy that was before him, he endured the shame, despising the shame of the cross, and therefore he gets a name above all names, a name at which all knees shall bow and all tongues shall confess that Jesus is Lord. But he's not just faithful. He's not just committed, but he's holy. He's the holy lamb of God. He's the spotless lamb of God. He lived a perfect life. He was without sin. He was holy, but he's also a praying God. Oh, I know, I know you don't, some of you don't know your Bible, but in my Bible it says he prayed all night long when it came time to call some disciples. I know Hezekiah when you prayed, you prayed some tears of bitterness, but our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. He prayed his till he sweated. His sweat dropped like blood. That He prayed when he was about to 
to go to the cross because our God, Jesus Christ, is a faithful God. He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. Our God is a committed God. He's committed to getting you to heaven. He's committed to your salvation. Our God is a holy God. Our God is a praying God, but he's also a humble God because he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life for a ransom. He didn't even have a place at the end when he was born. He didn't even have a place to lay his head because he is humble. He is meek, but he's not only humble. He's not only faithful. He's not only committed. He's not only a praying God. He's not only a holy God. God, but he is consistent. He is consistent. You can stand on the rock of Jesus Christ. You can stand on Jesus Christ. He is the stone the builders rejected. That you build your life around Jesus Christ. If you order your life around Jesus Christ, order your family around Jesus Christ, train your children up in Jesus Christ, teach your children that he's the way, the truth, the light. He'll provide stability in your life. Do I have a witness in here that can testify that God has been too good to me. God has been too faithful to me that when I met my heavenly parent, he loved me with an unchanging hand. See how great a love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. The world don't understand you because the world don't know him, but we got a heavenly Father that loved you so much that he sent his son into the world to die for you. That's why when they marched him from, from judgment hall to judgment hall, that's why when they marched him through the Villa Della Rosa. That's why when they marched him up Godolphus Mountain up to Calvary, he did it for you because he loved you because he was faithful to you. He was praying even on the cross. He prayed because he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit because we serve a committed God, a God who finishes the race, a God who for the joy that's before him, a God who is a finisher. God has called us to greatness. Jesus said in John chapter 14, you will do greater things than me. We ought to be greater parents. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't like to bring, bring these kind of sermons, but this was God and place in my heart. We ought to be doing better in the household of faith. God will judge the world but we're called to judge the church. We ought to do better, we know better. It ought not be our families is a mess. I'm preaching it. It ought not be our kids failing out and we don't know what's going on. It ought not be we at the church all the time and our kids don't know nothing about the Lord. It ought not be we tuning in to T TBN and Word Network and blab it and grab it and our kids don't want to have nothing to do with the Lord what's going on in your house that was Hezekiah's house that God judged he said your house is going to fall well I won't have to deal with it in my lifetime I'll have peace and security with my possessions when I'm dead and gone <laughs> whatever happens happens Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 says, a father, righteous father, leaves a blessing. The righteous pays a blessing for their children, children. We want to be faithful. We want to be committed. We ought to be holy. That means act right, live right. Stop when you get out the church house cussing. I know it. Oh, 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 my fault, Pastor. I'm sorry. Oh, 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 I forgot you was there. He said, when the left him alone, let me watch him. God said, I ain't going to send the prophet no more. You know, no, you at home right now, you, you don't get to come to the church, some, some of you all the time. L let me see what you're doing now. You get to be in your house with just you and your family. You can't hear the preach word all the time. You can't, you, you, you can't meet with the pastor all the time. God watching, looking at your heart. 
Your house ought to be better now. God, watch it. Stop being so arrogant. And that includes with your kids. You ain't always live right. Stop talking to them like they supposed to get it all right. <laughs> you don't even want them to even come around your friends from high school to talk about you. And be consistent. I don't like to talk too much about what I do, but I love the fact that my son say, you consistent. <laughs> I don't like it sometimes. But at least I know when I come to my mommy and daddy, they consistent. Your children should be able to say you consistent. Biological, spiritual, nieces, nephews, kids in the community, you ought not be the crazy Christian on the street. You ought to be consistent. It ought not be you, you cussing and showing out in the house, and then when they knock on the door to ask for you to donate for their little um, fundraiser, you like praise the Lord. 